Okay, so you realize that we would like to start. <laughs> I would like to warmly welcome to this panel, and I'm happy that you are here with us. And um, yes, this, I'm, I, I would like to introduce myself shortly. I'm Bettina Wademacher for, uh, from MDM Germany. Uh, yes, and it's, it's a pleasure for me uh, that you're here and our experts as well uh, with us. And as you know, um, Today we have this panel with the subject um, uh, never-ending emergency in DADAP. And I'm really looking forward for an inter interesting discussion with you and our experts. So I come to very often mentioned now the experts. <laughs> On my right side, uh, may I introduce you this Jedi William Nafur from UN Hot Air. Uh, welcome and thank you that you are, could come. <laughs> On my left side, this is James Mwangui. I, I tried, but I think it was wrong. <laughs> Maga no, no, sorry. <laughs> he's, he's from the Kenyan Red Cross. And on the outside, this is, uh, I'm really happy that you also could join us. It's Sabine Wilke from Care International Germany and Luxembourg, I think. Okay, welcome. So then I am handed over the microphone to, first of all, to Jedi, that he could introduce himself a bit and your organization. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Hi, everyone. My name is Jedi. I work for UNHCR, and I'm excited to be here. I don't know about the rest of you, since this is your weekend, so thank you very much for coming, and uh, it shows real passion and interest, and I look forward to uh, hearing from you. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is James Mwangi. I work for Kenya Red Cross. Uh, Kenya Red Cross is the largest humanitarian organization in Kenya, uh, driven by a focus to be the first one in any emergency situation and the last one to live. I have worked for this organization for the last seven years, and I'm here. I'm happy to be here and to be part of this discussion. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sabine Wilke, and I'm the media director for CARE in Germany, based in Bonn. CARE is, has been founded in 1945 with the delivery of uh, the famous CARE package to, packages to post-war Europe. And we, today we work in over 80 countries with around 10,000 staff. Um, and our main focus is emergency um, assistance and long-term development. Thank you. So, only just for your information, the pictures which you've seen, is, uh, the most of them are, from, uh, are given to us from Care International, from their projects, and some of them are, from, of course, are from our project, from MDM, Médecins du Monde, uh, Germany. In the network, we, have, uh, we had a project in DADAP. We supported the um, renovation of the DADAP hospital. So, you, you can see the pictures from all these activities. So, and the short overview how we structured now this panel is that um, every of our speakers will introduce the, their work. Um, and we, of course, we ask some questions and then you are really invited, um, the audience, uh, that you could ask questions and we try our best that we have a good and interesting uh, discussion and panel and exchange with you. Okay. So, um, now we would wanted to look at the situation from different aspects and different positions. So we, we start with um, the view and, um, of the UNHCR and that uh, Jedi give us an, a short overview of what's happened in DADAP the last 20 second years. You know, this is the largest, it's the longest refugee camp in the world. Uh, yes, and uh, may I ask you to present a short film I've heard. <laughs> Thank you, Bettina. Um, as uh, we said earlier, I'm from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Basically, who are we? We are the helpers. We are mandated by the United Nations to protect, to assist, and to seek uh, durable solutions to refugee problems. And how do we do that? Uh, we do that basically by leading, by coordinating, advocating and also mobilizing resources and support to help us uh, do our work. I brought with me a short film. It's about seven minutes long. 
just to help you all understand and get a sense of what the dab is like, the place, the people. Um, perhaps some of you have been there. I don't know if uh, you've had a chance uh, to also see other movies about it or films about it, but it will help you understand why we do what we do, why we're so passionate about the area, and why it is uh, the subject of this um, panel. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy this um, short film. He's wearing dog tags.
So I think now we have a, a short impression about the builder and <laughs> the pictures of Dadab. And now we are really interested to, to hear something about maybe the challenge and dilemmas. You know, in 1991, the refugee camp was established and it was planned for 90,000 refugees. And now we have about uh, 500,000 so, yes, J.D., could you tell us a bit about, from your opinion, what was the most challenges and the most dilemmas in the last 20 second years? Thank you. Um, having shown you that movie, you probably think that's basically what happens every day uh, and the life that uh, occurs on a daily basis in Dadaab. It's actually changed quite significantly since uh, the end of uh, 2011. Uh, what happened is um, following a series of uh, threats from insecurity, abductions, and uh, other sorts of uh, attacks in Kenya, the government of Kenya went inside uh, Somalia. And following that uh, military offensive where the Kenyans wanted to secure the border, we had a lot of uh, problems in terms of um, reprisal attacks by uh, the armed elements inside Somalia. And uh, it has made the dub a lot less safe. It's uh, quite insecure now. The situation is not as um, permissive for people who are aid workers, nor for the communities that live there. There are a lot of um, attacks. The government of Kenya has lost a lot of police. Uh, the refugees have lost uh, their lives, so have the nationals. And it's become a more dangerous place. So this has created a very insecure environment in terms of service delivery, because if you cannot access the services uh, in the camps, it's very difficult to make sure that people get food, people get shelter that uh, people are accessing health services, that they're getting the education, and they're able to go about uh, their day's business, uh, either earning a living or uh, trying to uh, support uh, the community. So those are some of the realities today. What has happened is um, you have about 400,000 people. They live in five different camps. These camps, if you take the population, I just gave you 400,000, basically make Dadaab the third most populated place in Kenya, after Nairobi and Mombasa. And it is today a huge challenge for us to support these people. You can imagine that in a city of, uh, that is the third largest in your respective countries, wherever you come from, 
the kind of services you need, the kind of infrastructure you need, the kind of uh, police you need, the kind of uh, health services, the education system. If that's the third largest city in your country, this is the dub. It has nothing like that. And so what you're trying to do on a daily basis is because you have very few resources to help you support 400,000 people, you're busy just trying to make sure that you're keeping them alive, you're keeping them safe, that they're able to get medicine or go to hospital when they fall ill, that they have food, that they have shelter, and on a string budget, it's very difficult to do all these things. And it is why we call it to this day still an emergency. It's still a humanitarian crisis. And um, I would be uh, also uh, here to listen to your ideas, to listen to what uh, you feel are some of the reasons why after 20 years, these people can still not go back to their country they're still living in camps, and how, as the international community, we can do better to support them, to improve the quality of their life, but also to help them perhaps find a lasting solution, either back home in Somalia or in another country, uh, Kenya or elsewhere, as some other countries have done by taking Somalis in and offering them uh, citizenship. Thanks. Thank you, Jedi. So now we, we collect information now at first before we come to you. <laughs> so please, uh, James, would you be so kind and uh, tell us about your organization, what you are doing? I will take you through a short presentation um, just to walk you through this. is a long journey to walk. For the Somali community that is in the DAB camps, and for the UNHCR that has been able to manage partnerships for 23 years, engaging the international communities to keep that support coming uh, for the refugees community in the DAB. Uh, like mentioned, um, the DAB complex has five camps spread in an area of about uh, 20 square kilometers. Um, we had three camps that were established in the 1990s, soon after the fall of the uh, government of Somalia. And we have, that is uh, Ifo, Hagadera, and Dagahli. And we have two camps that were established in the year 2011 uh, to cater for the population that could then uh, not be uh, accommodated in the older camps, and as a result of the influx that we witnessed in the year 2010 and 2011. The refugee camp is, is located in a remote um, uh, part of Kenya, which is northeastern region, and Kenya has a long border with Somalia, about 1,000 kilometers. And the population that we have in Dodab is mainly of Somali origin. Out of the 465,000 refugees that we have, 95% of them are of, are of Somali origin. And um, out of this, then we have refugees from other parts of Eastern and Central Africa. We have refugees from um, Rwanda. We have refugees from Burundi, Southern Sudan, and Northern Uganda. Um, the government of Kenya decided to adopt an encampment policy uh, when dealing with the issues of the refugees. And the Dab refugee complex is one of the refugee camps. We have a second camp, camp in the northwestern part of Kenya, which mainly uh, accommodates refugees from uh, southern Sudan. Apart from these two camps, we have a third population of refugees that are allowed by the government of Kenya to live and work to live in urban centers, mainly Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, and Nakuru, 
uh, they are not totally dependent on the humanitarian aid like the refugees who are encamped in Dadaab. Just a slide to show you the different nationalities that we have in Dadaab and a good majority of them are of Somali origin, as I've said. And from this slide, you can see the kind of trends that we have seen. And I've tried to look back uh, from the year 2009, how the populations come in and out of Dadaab. From the year 2011, when government of Kenya sent its defense forces into Somalia, the border was closed. But like I said, it is practically not possible for the government to surveil the whole 1,000 kilometers of border that we have in Somalia. And the second important thing that I would like to mention is that where we have the refugee camp in Dadaab, we have the same community on the Kenyan side, Kenyan Somalis, they share the same culture the same language, the same traditions, and the same religion with the refugees who live within the refugee camps. So with time, there are, there are shocks inside Somalia. Majority of the refugees that we have in Dadaab uh, are as a result of the protracted conflict of 23 years. But at the same time, there are other shocks inside, Somalia's that, inside Somalia that compels refugee people to move into Kenya. And one of them, which corresponds to the 2011, is the Horn of Africa drought then, that then uh, pushed refugees out of people from Somalia, not as, as um, asylum seekers of war, but running from the effects of the drought. Kenya Red Cross, um, in partnership with the UNHCR and supported by the Move, Red Cross movement partners, mainly the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, uh, began humanitarian operations in Dadaab in 2011, and it is, was given the mandate to run one of the newest refugee camps uh, in Dadaab, which is IFO2 refugee camp, established in July 2011. And like I said, uh, these are refugees who came in the last half of 2010 and the first half of 2011, driven by escalating violence in Somalia and the drought uh, of the Horn of Africa. The camp has a carrying capacity of 120,000 people, but uh, for the better part of 2012 and first half of 2011, 13, we've had a population of about 76,000 people. The Kenya Red Cross um, implements uh, humanitarian activities on two agreements with UNHCR, an operational partner agree uh, agreement where Red Cross moved with its own resources to support the refugee work. And also on the other hand, uh, it is partly supported by UNHCR as an implementing partner. And we are involved in four sectors, uh, health and nutrition, water, sanitation and hygiene, camp management and uh, prevention and response to gender-based violence. That is the uh, map of IFO2 refugee camp. It was planned in 2011 as a model camp uh, in Dadaab. Um, we've dealt with a number of humanitarian emergencies, uh, small-scale small emergencies in Dadaab, and just the situation as it were in 2011 uh, we had a humanitarian crisis when this population came in. Uh, a number of indicators to that. We had a pop, uh, outbreaks that were going on in the larger Dadaab uh, area, which is an outbreak of cholera, which had been declared uh, in 2011, August. Uh, we had an outbreak of measles, the same period, which had begun in 2011. We had the rates of acute malnutrition at the highest, with a mean of 38.3 as the global acute malnutrition, and uh, severe acute malnutrition was measured at 18.8%. And the rates of acute malnutrition at that time was highest in the two new camps, that is IFO2 camp and Cambios. And then the mortalities were indicative as they were higher than the, the, the threshold uh, for emergencies. In the hygiene and sanitation sector, we had, being a new camp, it was poor in infrastructure, and we had between eight and 12 families sharing a common latrine, and one 
household in Dadaab has an average size of six. So you can imagine the number, the indecency that comes with that number of people sharing a common uh, pit latrine as a latrine and also as a bathroom. Uh, in 2011, we had a new dynamic. When Kenya sent its defense forces into Somalia, then the operating environment in Dadaab changed. Um, we had increase in security uh, driven by two issues. One, the economic aspect of the militants in Somalia taking hostage refugee workers from Dadaab and taking them into Somalia and demanding ransom. And the second one was the direct targeting of the security forces and the government machinery in Dadaab uh, in an attempt by the militants to compel the government to pull out uh, of Somalia. And um, they were using improvised explosive devices and the trigger mechanism was often a mobile phone. So you can imagine somebody targeting a police vehicle moving between, at between 80 and 120 kilometers per hour and be able to trigger through a mobile phone and, and hit that vehicle. That tells you that we were not dealing uh, with the ordinary unemployed youth in Dadaab. These are people who are skilled and we had this insecurity then uh, spread out of Dadaab into the major cities of, of, of Kenya and I'll talk about that uh, shortly. I just want to quickly take you through the small, small emergencies that often do not come uh, to the attention of the international community, but these are realities that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in our operations in Dadaab. I talked about an, uh, an outbreak of measles in 2011 and 2012, and this corresponded to the time that um, uh, the refugees came in um, with malnourished children, and we know the relationship that exists between transmission of, of measles and, and the levels of acute malnutrition, where children are malnourished and their immune system is, is then compromised. And we have very good um, routine immunization um, coverage in the older camps in Dadaab, but the population that came in from Somalia were then coming from uh, a background of a community where there is no structures in, the, in Somalia uh, for health, for vaccination, and therefore the children were largely uh, non-immunized. Then we've dealt with the number of outbreaks of polio, and polio, Kenya was just about in 2006 to be declared a polio-free country, but as a result of the importation of cases of polio from Somalia and also from South Sudan, which is also another country that has gone through a similar experience with Somalia, protracted war for over two decades, then uh, that was a major setback for the, for the country. And I want to just show you in that map distribution, spatial distribution of uh, cases of polio in, from 2006 and 2013. And you can see uh, the location on the left side where we have large concentration, that is Dadaab, on the, and on the northern side, that is uh, cases in Kakuma. And if, I, if you could be able to look at the, the figure that I have on the left side, uh, you can see from Somalia, as refugees come into Kenya, uh, they follow as a common migratory pattern. And our experience is that um, when you look at here, we have um, along the migratory routes having concentration of uh, locally conditions that are being transmitted. Polio cases picked along the migratory routes of, of between the border of Kenya and, and Dadaab. And this is a common pattern that we have observed, that every time we have an outbreak in Somalia of cholera, of measles, of polio, then it follows the same transmission uh, locally in, in the host community in Dadaab. And I will talk about that and the implication it has for uh, the most common problem, the latest common problem we are dealing with is importation of multi drug-resistant TB into the DAB camps. 
Uh, we have had initiatives to control these outbreaks, uh, most often for vaccine preventable diseases, then we, we carry out supplemental immunization activities to be able to boost the, uh, the proportion of children who are vaccinated and then that we would expect naturally would develop immunity and reduce their vulnerability to the future outbreaks. Another outbreak uh, is cholera. Cholera is a common problem in Dadaab because of the huge concentration of the population and uh, the dilemma of maintaining uh, the hygiene standards that would be expected uh, to prevent uh, outbreak of cholera in Dadaab. And this has happened a time and again, both in, inside the refugee camps and in the hosting community, and often this follows outbreaks in Somalia. Uh, those are some of the initiatives that we take to, maintain, to control cholera, case management, contact tracing, and hygiene promotion. Then the other outbreak that we deal with on a regular basis is the acute jaundice, uh, which is also uh, um, related to poor hygiene and sanitation, and the mortality rates are high in, in, pregnant, and, uh, in pregnant women. Uh, spatial distribution in E42 camp. Uh, I talk about briefly the multidrug resistant TB. We have 76 patients as at September, that is last month, concentrated in Dadaab. And this is a huge problem because on average, we are having 10 MDR positive uh, TB patients coming from Somalia. In Somalia, there are diagnostic services that are available to the population there, but we don't have a stable treatment program. So every refugee, um, every person who is uh, diagnosed to have MDR TB then comes to Dadaab, uh, comes to seek treatment. And this could be the largest concentration of MDR TB that we have in the world. It's a huge problem, uh, not only for the, in the camps, but also along the migratory routes where these uh, people are coming uh, through into the refugee camps from Somalia. Some of the key achievements that we've, we've made as Kenya Red Cross in Dadaab, uh, first one is that being a new camp, then the level of infrastructure was poor. We have been able to improve the infrastructure in Dadaab. Right now, we have 100 capacity hospital that is um, providing secondary and tertiary health care to the refugees, not only uh, from E42, but as Kenya Red Cross, we are also managing the referral program for UNHCR for the larger Dadaab uh, refugee complex. And what has been there in the past is that the refugees who cannot access secondary and tertiary health care in Dadaab are then transported by road to uh, the provincial hospital in Garissa town, which is about 100 kilometers uh, from Dadaab, or to the capital center of Ke capital city of Kenya, we have a national referral hospital, but this is uh, 500 kilometers away from Dadaab, and the transportation is is by road in a poorly developed infrastructure infrastructure area. So the cost of this is huge. So what we are looking at as Kenya Red Cross is then to bring consultants into Dadaab and be able to spread this benefit into to a larger uh, group of refugees. The second uh, achievement is the improvement of nutrition indicators, and we, we talked about 38.3 as global acute malnutrition in 2011. We've been able to bring that down to a level of 10.6 as measured by the nutrition survey carried out in August. We've also uh, invested in health information system, moving the whole patient management, system, management from the paper, conventional paper-based into a uh, uh, an electronic system, and we have seen a lot of benefits on that. Um, then on hygiene and sanitation, we've been able to, to put up uh, 12,000 latrines, 8,000 supported by movement partners within the Red Cross, and 4,000 latrines supported by uh, UNHCR. Uh, some of the challenges um, that I would like to talk about is um, over the last two years, we are seeing reduction in funding for the DAB, and, and I'm sure it is the same experience that UNHCR is going through. Uh, so um, there are calls about repatriation of the refugees from Dadaab back to Somalia. Uh, the government of Kenya and the government of Somalia are focused on that. 
uh, and it's a whole dimension that probably we'll be able to, to talk about. The second one is um, the issue of insecurity. Uh, it is extremely difficult for organizations to work in Dadaab without armed security escort, and armed security escorts come uh, with its challenges. And when talking about the issue of, uh, as I wind up, as talking about the issue of repatriation, we have 10,000 children who are that generation in Dadaab. And people who are aged below 23 years who live in Dadaab do not have a connection with Somalia. They have been born and raised in the camps. They form a good proportion of the population that we have in Dadaab. Um, how do they go back and into a country they have never been to? That's one. Number two, we have the Somalis community that are living in Europe. And I can talk about in uh, countries like um, Britain, like um, Australia, Norway, and the Americas, like Canada and the United States. It's a critical mass of people who have connection with Somalia, who have gotten good international education, but they have not been involved in the discussion about repatriation of the refugees. And, and there are opportunities in Somalia for them. Uh, they can bring in their experiences and investments into Somalia. Um, briefly, that's that's. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for listening. Thank you very much, James, for, for your really detailed uh, presentation. So now we come to Sabine, uh, who's working for an international NGO, CARE. And uh, yes, please, could you be shortly tell us about um, yes the situation the different kind of view more than the support of community structures uh, from your experience thank you thank you i'll be very brief looking at the time and i'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, maybe just a short anecdote for everyone to get an idea of what it is like to work in Dadaab. I spent a couple of weeks there in 2011. Some of you might remember there was a big drought across the Horn of Africa and uh, some parts of Somalia were even declared um, as, a, as a famine. So there was a large influx of refugees from Somalia into Dadaab within a couple of months. Before that, we had around roughly 500 refugees coming every month. And then in June and July of 2011, there was um, on a daily basis, there was about 1,000 refugees coming to Dadaab each day. So you can imagine the challenges for all of the humanitarian actors on the ground to, um, to deliver aid to all of these people. So I was there for a couple of weeks, and um, I received an email from my former boss, who, who I've worked with in Haiti, and he sent me this mail saying, I see you're in Dadaab. I can still remember when we set up the camps in 1991, and I can't imagine that people are still living there. So every um, humanitarian aid worker, whether it's for CARE or for MSF or for any organization, at one point in his or her professional life, we do come across the DAB and we do deal with the DAB because it's, it is one of the most complex and as we, you know, the, the name of the panel is the never ending emergency, one of the biggest chronic emergencies uh, in this world. Um, so, as we said, it was set up for 90,000 people in 1991, and I still remember we released, um, we sent out a press release in 2009 saying the number of refugees had just passed the 300,000 mark. That was in 2009. And then two years later, we were up to almost half a million. Just to give you an idea of what it means for a camp structure to, 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 um, to expand this quickly, um, and what it means for, for people to live in these types of circumstances for many years. Um, just quickly about CARES work, I'll be very brief. Um, we have 200 staff there in, uh, in Dadaab. We've worked there since 1991, so since day one. Um, all of our staff are Kenyan nationals. We have one international um, uh, colleague there, and we also have, and that's something that I, I feel very strongly about, we have about 1,500, 1,500 um, refugee incentive workers is what we call them. So these are Somali refugees who actually do humanitarian work in Dadaab. They are teachers, they distribute food, and this is not just for CARE, it's also for UNHCR, for the Kenyan Red Cross. We heavily rely on the Somalis to, 
deliver aid themselves and to help themselves. And, and I'll, I'll go back to that point later. CARE is um, uh, the main partner for the World Food Program to distribute food. So World Food Program um, um, uh, caters the food, if you like, and we do um, bi-monthly food distributions um, in three camps. These are just basic staples like flour, oil, sugar, um, lentils, uh, everything for people to, to get by and to, to have some, some basic, uh, basic food supplies, which they then, of course, um, uh, well, enhance or they, they do their markets in the dub and there are people who try to, to plant vegetables or they grow, um, they, um, they raise cattle. So there's a couple of, um, uh, of options to get, uh, get more food and a more diverse food basket, if you like. Um, CARE is also um, um, delivering primary education in one of the camps, Dagahali, about 18,000 um, students um, receive education there. Again, almost 400,000 refugees in Dadaab. You can imagine this is, it's not enough and it's never enough. Education is a major, major challenge in Dadaab. And what we can do as agencies is mainly primary education, but it doesn't go much further than that. We do a little bit of vocational training. 48% of the population of Dadaab are youth, and these people just sit there and they have nothing to do. So we try to, to give them um, training and, and other options. Some people also do uh, they go to, to university by um, remotely. There's people, refugees in Dadaab, who go to university in Nairobi um, by correspondence, which I find really uh, striking and encouraging. So food distribution, primary education, um, water is a big issue in Dadaab. Um, most of you might know that Dadaab is in the uh, northeastern part of Kenya, so water supply is... Uh, this, it's not a region that was set up for almost uh, well, more than 400,000 people to live there. So CARE has been working on, um, it's basically boreholes, water pipes, water distribution points to make sure that every refugee has um, the basic um, um, access to water. Um, the sphere standards most of the time are being... Um, uh, achieved, but not all the time, unfortunately. Uh, we also, as we've been there for a long time, we do logistics for all of the um, uh, humanitarian um, aid organizations there. You can imagine there's lots of cars in Dadaab, so we have a little vehicle a repair shop, we do fuel distribution, warehouses, etc. So there's a big uh, uh, coordination and, uh, and the, the humanitarian community works very closely. And we are all in one spot, so that's something also to remember, like uh, in terms of coordination, it's, it's pretty easy because everyone <laughs> lives and works in the same place and we share um, many, many services and, and, and help each other out. Um, one last um, well, sector of work we deal with and that's something that is a big challenge but also very, very important for those people who've lived in Dadaab for 20 years and who've never seen anything else is community development. And this, is, um, this can be vocational training for youth, as I've said before, but this can also be uh, awareness uh, raising against sexual and gender-based violence, um, trying to um, encourage the population to find some, some means of referral systems, etc. because let's not kid ourselves, these are communities and these are, it's, it's a city that has, been, that has developed there over the last couple of years and you cannot um, there's no, no mayor of, of the DAB and you have to, to help people organize themselves and, and to watch out for each other. So that's, um, that's another um, a part of, of the work we do. Um, and I would say in terms of challenges, one was definitely the spike, the immense influx of refugees in 2011 when all of the agen agencies in the DAB were put under enormous stress to um, to, to expand our services. Um, most of the refugees arrived in Dadaab and didn't know where to go, so you had people in the outskirts of the, of the settled areas of, uh, of the refugee camp who didn't even know where to go, where to, go, go uh, where to get food, where to get water, um, single mothers, unaccompanied children. So just finding these people and putting up referral and information systems for all of these Somali refugees to to get assistance, because there is assistance, it's basic and it's never going to be enough, but just to get uh, the information to where the people are has been a major, major um, challenge. Also, everything else that comes with scaling up a big um, operation, all of you who work in, in humanitarian um, issues know what it means to recruit more staff, to get more vehicles, logistics, etc. So that has been a major challenge for, for all of us um, in 2011. And another one that I feel very strongly about, um, as I've said before, many people 
uh, there's people that have been they were born in Dadaab and now still live there and they only have the option to stay there or to go back to Somalia where there's still a war going on so chances are they might get killed so the, the better option of the two, two bad options if you like, is, is to stay in Dadaab and these people, many of the people um, the young people who were born in Dadaab are now working as, as teachers for example so they've, they were born and raised in Dadaab they are still there and I think it's one of the most basic dilemmas of, of humanitarians in such a chronic emergency that goes on for 20 years is how do you balance um, the delivery of, of basic uh, humanitarian aid because of course these people need to um, to get food, they need to get water, we need to, to cater for, for their needs but how do you also make sure that you do that in a, in a way that doesn't undermine their dignity because if you look in these people's faces and you see someone who has to queue for food two times a month for 20 years, that's something that does something to you and to your own personal dignity. So empowering these people to, to be part of the operation, to be, to be food distributors themselves, or also to find ways to organize themselves and be a bit more self-sufficient and self-reliant, I think that's one of the, the most challenging aspects of our work. And I'm not just talking for care, I'm talking for everyone, I think, on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sabina. I've, I think that was really interesting and, and important that you also see this uh, or add, add this to our discussion. These points are really important. Thank you. So, and I think last not least, uh, everybody knows that uh, one of the most important and um, yeah issue is the security situation in Dadaab. So, um, before we start, uh, that you're asking your question, I think maybe we should uh, give Jenny the opportunity to talk about from your point of view about the security situation in, in Dadaab and what do you think, maybe you cannot say it, but uh, you cannot predict, of course, but yeah, what is your opinion and your experience? Thank you. Uh, thanks. I, I mean, you said it, we can't really forecast the security. We know what the government has tried to do. The government has been uh, reinforcing its police presence, its uh, surveillance capabilities, and uh, UNHCR has been supporting the government uh, by offering one uh, material support uh, so that these police who come to the dub, as you heard, it's a very poor region. They have housing, they have offices, we provide them with vehicles. We also make sure that we provide them with communications. And uh, one other thing is we train them. We train them in human rights law, we train them in refugee law, both international and national so that uh, as they're working in a refugee area, they know the rights of refugees, but they also are able to uh, respect um, the obligations that they have towards uh, the refugees. So in terms of security, that is really what we can do as an agency, but I think it's really a question for all of us uh, as the international community. Um, the situation in Somalia has lasted 20 years and more, and we're still counting. And uh, the reason these people are refugees in Dadaab is because their home is insecure, and uh, they cannot live peacefully, they cannot uh, go about having a life at home. Uh, we mentioned um, education. Uh, many refugees, and I, I link this to security, many refugees are uneducated. Uh, right now in Dadaab, only three out of every 10 children who is supposed to be in primary is in school. So you can imagine us and those people we know, if you took four of your friends, you are the fourth one, and you imagine that the other three are not in primary school when you're in primary school. That's the situation in the dub today. It's worse in secondary. In secondary, it's only 7% of the population who are supposed to be in secondary, who are in secondary. So it's less than one out of every 10. And you have 90% of the youth who are out of school have no job, no job whatsoever. So nine out of 10 youth you see around are just loitering. And that is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for insecurity. They're fodder for any negative forces or people who want to cause trouble. And it 
it links the need to provide a base access to a basic right like education to, for these children so that they have an opportunity to do something with their life, to make something out of their lives, but also to stay out of trouble. And another statistic that's very troubling is in the primary school age children, only one out of every four is a girl, meaning there are three out of four girls who should be in school who are not in school. And these are going to be the future mothers. They are illiterate. The men or who, the boys who become men who are not in school, also illiterate. And you can imagine the vulnerability and the risks this creates to society. So we need to seriously think about 20 years on, what can we do to stabilize Somalia? This next generation is illiterate, is uneducated. How do we help them, one, make something out of their life, but also when they go home, they're able to build a stable, prosperous uh, country so that we no longer face such a situation. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Yes, yes, now you are invited to ask questions if you like, so, okay. I collect some. Um, could somebody help? Yes. The first, maybe, if you start here. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, I'm Carolina Boussada, I'm working for MSF. Um, thank you for the presentations you've all done. I have a, and I'm playing my, uh, MSF, uh, you know, as uh, we're supposed to, to play from time to time, but instead um, I understand that we're happy to empower people and make them part of the food distribution, but shouldn't we challenge the system itself, the fact that we actually have people in camps for the last 20 something years? The, I mean, the title was the never ending emergency. We can talk about chronic emergency and that's definitely a challenge for organization, even uh, including for MSF, because we're confronted to that quite often. But it's the, the frame itself uh, of how do we today, uh, and here we can talk about the humanitarian landscape, as uh, Eve said this morning, but how can we not tackle the system in itself, that we are having people in camps and for having worked in Dadaab as well, uh, it's uh, definitely one of the least places of the world where you would like to spend the last 20 years uh, of your life. But it's, the system has to be challenged. I mean, the, so what do you think about that? And one other question for UNHCR. Uh, it has also been a challenge for UNHCR to actually deal with the, the various actors and being uh, a bit uh, stuck in between the Kenyan government uh, and the, you know, the political landscape in Somalia and Kenya. How do you deal with that? Uh, especially knowing that you, know, you have a next come with the states and how can you address that uh, towards your uh, uh, executive committee, which are composed of states, which have interest in this, uh, in this uh, camp? And it's going back to the first question on how can you as a UN agency in charge of refugees and in charge of DADAP for the last uh, 20 years, deal with this, uh, you know, unsolved question of the, of the frame. Thank you. Um, okay, here. Now, my question was just to reinforce your second point. Um, and having heard your point, James, sorry, my, my name's Adrio Baquetta, former MSF, now a oh, consultant. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just, just this point of the UNHCR's role, your, your point, James, saying in your list of points, you were saying uh, decreasing funding, um, increasing problems with security, uh, unstable situation in Somalia. So uh, what sort of pressures are the UNHCR under? What are the, it's a very difficult role you have playing the interest of states. Okay, are you in a position where you can say confidently that the the processes that you're running as the UNHCR, the outcomes are in the interests of the people, 
and less in the interests of the governments that are putting you under pressure, for example. Okay. So, Jedi, you are ready to give the... <laughs> Oh, he's Sorry, thank you. I'll start with the last question and then I'll come to yours. Hopefully I can answer both. Um, what we're doing, is it in the interest of the people or in the interest of the governments? Um, as I guess you're discussing this in the context of the government pressure that there should be more returns to Somalia than there has been up to now. And uh, there's also discussions, bilateral discussions, between the two governments to prepare the ground for return into Somalia. This has been something that we as UNHCR have decided to support as follows. And this is what our High Commissioner has said, that for now, we will support all the spontaneous returns to Somalia. So if you're a refugee in Kenya, for instance, and you decide that you wish to go back home, UNHCR will support you. There is a second part to that. If you are returning to an area that we know something about, we will let you know what we know about that area. But it should be voluntary, and the government of Kenya has repeatedly said that they would respect any voluntary returns. They would not force people to return. Um, and that is our understanding, and that is the policy we're pursuing for now. There will come a time that we've also said that once we know more about the so-called safe areas in Somalia, we would also facilitate returns to those areas. We have a team in Somalia and they are now also working together with the colleagues who are in Kenya to coordinate whatever support that is going to be provided to those who choose to return. In, in, on the question that you asked about what sort of pressure we are under, yes, of course, um, we cannot deny that there is pressure. Uh, Kenya has said it's been 20 plus years uh, but there's also pressure, I think, from the refugees. Uh, you can imagine if you're a refugee, uh, put yourself in their shoes. You've been in the same place for those who came with the initial wave. 20 years plus. A camp life is really not a life because you're confined. And after two decades, if I'm to ask you as a refugee, what does the future look like? I don't think you imagine it continuing in the camp. And I think for many, the reason it's lasted 20 years is because you know, no one believed that it would actually, Somalia would continue in turmoil or in crisis for 20 years. And every effort that has somehow given a glimmer of hope has unfortunately uh, been very short-lived. So. We now have an opportunity where there is a government in Somalia, is supported by the African Union to secure the country, it's support, who are also supported by the United Nations. Uh, there are several key donor countries uh, from the West uh, and also from, uh, I think Turkey is also quite big in Somalia right now, who are trying to stabilize the country. and. The situation has not been this good in quite some time. So I think if Somalis feel it's time for them to go, the best we can do is to support them go back. But I don't think it's our place to tell them it's not safe for you to go back if they have voluntarily decided they want to go back. And so that is perhaps what I can uh, say to that particular question. Thank you. And um, maybe, James, could you say something about your question regarding system has to be changed in the refugee camp? What, maybe you can, can repeat a bit, what is, what, what, which kind of system do you mean? Yes, it's the system is exist, of course, but the NGO is not responsible, I'm not I sure. Just, for example, how can we be happy that sometimes the Sphere standards are applied, sphere standards are only used for emergencies. 
So we are basically talking about a standard that is being applied and not all the time because in July 2011 there were 0.5 liters per day per person available in some areas um, in, in a, basically a city because Dadaab is today um, a kind of a city. So it's, it's this that should be challenged. Not, we shouldn't be happy that basically people are part of the food distribution and it empowers them or that the sphere standards are most of the time applied, but this very thing has to be discussed. Well, I think um, the decision by the government when those camps were established in early 1990s to enforce um, the encampment policy has been a major restriction for what the community, the refugee community can do. And I want to tell you that the Somali community are determined people, they are entrepreneurial people, and wherever they go, they start their business, they are successful people. Um, I see the situation change in a foreseeable future. And if, I, if you allow me to borrow from the experience that we had with South Sudan, and I mentioned that this is another country that was in war for 20, more than 20 years. We saw their determination to rebuild their country. And we are seeing similar opportunities in Somalia. Uh, we have seen spontaneous returns uh, of, of refugees from Dadaab into Somalia. Of course, the level of infrastructure inside Som the South Central Somalia is poor, and the level of access to services will be poor, will be challenging. But I want to believe that if these people are supported uh, to move back to Somalia, and we have in Dadaab had an interagency forum chaired by UNHCR to look at modalities within which we can be able to support those who are spontaneously returning, just to give them a small startup package to go and settle in Somalia. I can see a very successful Somalia country in the next coming decade, yeah? Um, the security situation, of course, inside Somalia will be a major determining factor. It is the major drive from the Kenyan government perspective uh, because of the national security. I think from 2011, <laughs> To date, we have had more than 70, 70 attacks on churches, on entertainment spots, and the most recent, which is in everyone's mind, is the hostage situation in Westgate Mall. All, all these attacks are linked to, um, to Dadaab, to operatives in Dadaab. Uh, from the perspective of the Somalia government, much of the area, south central area, have been liberated. They need people to settle down there and to have people to govern. Um, we had hostage situation um, where colleagues from MSF Spain were taken in 2011 and they were just recently released in the month of June, um, I believe. And we had also four um, expatriates from Norwegian Refugee Council also taken hostage in 2012, month of June. So it's a whole dynamic situation, but uh, I think the overarching picture and what I would want us to have a look to, to think about is how strong the determination is for the refugees in Dadaab to go back to their country and to rebuild their country. Okay, thank you. I have a few rather short questions. Ivan from MSF. You are not from MSF. You are from. I, I'm, I, my name is Ivan, and I am from MSF. Um, how can you speak of a voluntary return to a country at war from a place where there's that level of malnutrition and where the sphere standards are sometimes met? How can you speak of asking someone to go back home who was born in Kenya, whose parents were born in Kenya, and whose grandparents fled Somalia decades ago? Is it because we are sure that now things are finally going to get better in Somalia that we can continue sustaining this system, which is, I believe, Jetty, you referred to the situation as confinement. They cannot work. They cannot 
do anything. It is effectively, other than the right to return into the jaws of war, it is effectively very much like a prison. And is it now acceptable, because we are quite sure that things are going to be better in Somalia, that we continue? And perhaps, you know, that your question about what is the system, is it a system of humanitarian detention? Sorry, those are very provocative questions, but uh, there they are. Uh, enjoy. Sergio Bianchi, surprisingly enough, from MSF. Um, just one comment and perhaps one question. The comment is linked to the uh, previous intervention. Uh, per situation in Somalia is better than before? Yes, of course, yes. Still, we, did, we run an assessment in August. Half of the houses of our beneficiaries do not protect them from rain. Uh, you have high level of uh, low access to water, and this is Mogadishu, this is not Baidoa, okay? So we are speaking in the most peaceful part of Somalia. So I mean, when we um, speak about Somalia being better off than before, we should, I mean, we should really think of what Somalia, what is Somalia now? Should, would we send back people to this kind of living conditions? I don't think that is even near to humanitarian. Second, and that is my comment, take it as personal if you want. Um, my question, which is more, uh, let's say, institutional one, is that we spoke about difficulties in scaling up operations. Uh, this Congress is about access. Um, having been in uh, Dadaab, my question is quite easy. How do we scale up when we are not allowed to get out of the uh, UNN, UN compound? How do we uh, actually uh, pour in resources, manpower, uh, and everything which is needed to avoid the outbreaks uh, um, Mr. Mwangi uh, present to us? Because what, happens, or what happened in the last two years is that we have been um, in a, a borderline with emergency, and when there is a small or big problem, we fall into a humanitarian crisis. So even the system, uh, Ms. Abusada was criticizing, it's basically perpetuating a quasi-crisis that at the first impediment results into a, a, a huge, huge, huge crisis with a lot of people who dies and so on and so forth. Thank you. Okay, who would like to answer? <laughs> um, I find it really encouraging that MSF feels very strongly about ADAPT, so thank you for your comments. Um, no, I mean that in a very honest way. To just make one, sorry? Yeah. No, no, it's good. I mean, we, we want this to be a discussion. Just to make one thing clear, we're not happy about not meeting the sphere standards. We don't pat ourselves on the back when we have done a successful food distribution. We're not happy about the system as such, and we do question it. So it is something where, I mean, there's a couple of actors involved, and it's not a decision, you know, the future of Dadaab is not a decision that's in the hands of an, a non-governmental organization. It is um, hosted by the Kenyan uh, government, so there's a lot of political implications and there are a lot of negotiations going on. Um, many of the organizations uh, that do work in Ladab also do um, private advocacy on many levels. Um, would we prefer doing development work in uh, Somalia? Yes, CARE does. We work in Puntland in Somaliland, in agriculture, in women's economic uh, development, and many, many other, uh, other areas, because we do see there's a lot of work to be done in, in, in Somalia, and the country is far from being safe or being a place where people can actually uh, make ends meet on their own. But we come back to the question of security, and your, your, your point is very important. We had a major problem when the first cases of abduction and kidnapping happened in Dadaab in 2011, that many of the international or even Kenyan staff couldn't move freely in the camps anymore. So I think a good basis for um, continuing our services was actually the refugee incentive program. It didn't work perfectly, and of course there's still a lot to be done, but to, to enable Somali refugees who know the system and who know uh, their, their neighbors and their communities who speak the language, I think is uh, was actually a, a very, a very good move. It is not. It is far from perfect. That's for sure. And we do, um, you know, constantly negotiate and, and talk about uh, 
uh, improving access and, and making uh, making sure that uh, humanitarian aid workers are not uh, not put into into danger. Um, also, our refugees, because to be to be honest, it's not only the aid workers that are um, uh, exposed to threats like uh, like landmines or, or hand grenades. It's also mostly the Somalian refugees who um, who have you know who <coughs> encounter security uh, incidents. So. The system is not perfect, and would we want to not work in Dadaab? For sure. We would really rather want to do other things and not stay in Dadaab and have these people confined uh, uh, and, and standing in line queuing for food um, twice a month. Thank you. Would like uh, somebody else add something also with the point uh, why um, we, or you and Sarge RGA, um, would like to. That, um, motivated the refugee that they go back to Somalia in a violent region, so maybe with this point as well. Okay. Um, on the question of uh, sending people back, I don't believe, um, one, that we are sending people back uh, as UNHCR. W what I said was, is that there are people who have spontaneously decided to go back home. And the if I may finish, I, di I didn't interrupt you, so please, if I may finish. Um, I cannot claim to know better than a native of a certain place. I'm not from Somalia. I don't know if you are. But most of these refugees come from South Central Somalia. We also know that uh, based on a recent uh, population verification, it's like a census that we do every two years that the population has dropped by around 20% in the camps. It used to be half a million two years ago, it's now 400,000. We also know that, as was mentioned earlier, that these are nomadic communities. They move back and forth. They share kinship, they share language, they share culture. They're also many times from the same or similar clans or subclans. So there is constant movement. We also know that refugees go back to farm their land and then leave the family back in the camp. So people are moving. There is movement. If a family or a member of a household decides to go back and it's a voluntary decision, they were not forced to do it, I don't think any one of us is in a position to stop them from going back. What we can try and do is make sure that when they go back, They'll be safe. They'll be able to initially support themselves because we know what the situation is like and that they'll be able to stay there for as long as they choose to stay there because, after all, that is their home. So it's not that we're sending them back, but the, the point that we need to be mindful of is that the government of Kenya has said, after 20 years, it's now 23, we will not force anyone to go back. We will respect the principle that any return should be voluntary. So this is why we've said, if someone wants to spontaneously go back and they let us know, we will support them. But I think it will be wrong not to support someone who wants to go home because we feel we know more than they do. I, I somehow am uncomfortable with that uh, idea. And I think our High Commissioner has also said, if someone wants to go back spontaneously, support them and do what you can to make sure they go back safely. And uh, that's basically uh, what I would contribute to that point. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Just very briefly, um, let me give you a different picture. Inside, um, inside the refugee camps, you need to walk for one to one and a half kilometer to access healthcare. And you need to walk for less than 100 meters to get water from a tap stand. And school, the same uh, 500 meters. When you move out of the confines of the refugee camp into the host community, the average distance to a health facility is 50 kilometers. And to a primary school is 10 kilometers and talk about piped water, it doesn't exist. I talked about this being the same community. 
and majority of them uh, traditionally are uh, nomadic pastoralists. And I think there are going to be, there are many obstacles that stand between uh, the life in the camp and a successful life uh, back in Somalia. Of course, 23 years getting food for free, getting health care for free, getting education for free. Uh, the biggest obstacle would then be to cut this dependency on humanitarian aid. But I think what I want to look at is, the, is us not focusing so much on the obstacles that are there, uh, but to give this community a starting point back in Somalia. And, and like uh, my colleague said, is that we have seen a reduction in the population uh, driven by free movement of the refugees back to Somalia. The conditions are not ideal, uh, but comparing the life of independence out there in Somalia and the camp life that we see, the scale of violence that we see inside those refugee camps is unimaginable. And nobody wants to raise his family, at least from the African understanding of the, the ideals of a family. Nobody wants to raise children in a, in a, in a background of a camp where somebody is slaughtered every day. They have the determination to go back to Somalia, but when we talk to them, their concern is where is, my going, where is my child going to school back to Somalia? So I think the focus of the international community would then be how do we develop infrastructure in Somalia for the conditions to be easier for the returning refugees rather than continue to live inside the refugee camps. And camp life, there is no life, like my, say, my colleague said. So we see the determination of them uh, wanting to go back, but there are those small, small obstacles. But if they are given a good platform, they will go back. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Maria Luisa Schage from Leipzig. I'm a med student. Um, first, uh, thanks a lot for you being here and for giving us the report. Um, I wanted to ask, like now the discussion is just like turning about these two points, like for on the one hand you can stay in the camp, on the other hand you can go back, but I don't know a lot about the region or about Somalia or politics in this region, but isn't this a bit limited for like problems so complex because um, Badab is not the only like refugee camp who's existing for decades now and these camps are actually turning into cities, but they don't have like, the in, like you said first, the infrastructure of the city. So um, I think, of course, it's a very important work, like all the humanitarian um, organizations are doing there. But isn't it like the, in my idea, the, the goal should be to make yourself not used anymore. So shouldn't there be like more, I don't know what is happening right now, but shouldn't there be more political stress and more political pressure, like not only for the Kenyan government, but only for, also for international um, politics to pay attention to that problem and how to deal with it and found a, like a real solution, not only like, okay, you can stay here, go back. Hello, my name is Anais Kanfer. I'm a student in Geneva. Uh, going back to the general theme of the conference of no access, who cares, I would like to touch upon this idea of if we were to accept this policy of return, which personally I think I agree more with Ivan, like where can you define voluntary or spontaneous return when you're living in a no life, as you said, on the camp. But okay, even if we were to accept it, where is our duty as humanitarian workers? Like we know that the access is already difficult in the bad. I imagine the access will be even more difficult in South Somalia, considering especially that almost all the government control is basically in Mogadishu and that's it. So what is our duty as humanitarian workers? Do we still care? Do we still want to access them once they are back? Do we even being more provocative because they are in theory now home, we just turn around and don't look back? What type of challenges and how are we, do we think we should tackle them? 
in this type of situations. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we start with, uh, yes, maybe uh, with the question of um, should we do more political, or who should do the more pressure on, on the political level uh, that maybe one day these kind of refugee camps um, should be not necessary anymore, but this is a really, <laughs> I'm not really sure that's more than, than a vision, but maybe you can say something to that? I'll, I'll try. Um, what we know now on the political situation and the future in Somalia is that there is a government in place, there is a parliament in place, they are trying to expand their authority and to stamp their authority throughout the rest of the country. They are, if you know the geography of Somalia, they're mostly now based in the capital, but with the support of the African Union, who have a military uh, force there, they've managed to basically spread the area that is under government authority. The refugees that we have uh, we're speaking about in the dub, come mostly from the south and the central regions of uh, Somalia, which is still largely under the control of opposition forces. So there are pockets where people are able to go and there are po pockets where people are presently living. But in terms of the general situation, it will take time and sustained support from the international community in terms of attention, in terms of uh, resources, and uh, in terms of uh, support, concretely development aid, to actually make a difference on the ground in Somalia. And this is what I believe James was referring to earlier, that we need to have at least a development plan for Somalia developed by the government, therefore by the Somali people. And then if the international community can align themselves behind this government and help them deliver on this plan, it would create the conditions for people to go back and to live uh, in dignity, more humanely uh, than uh, they can uh, at the current um, conditions in the camp. That's what I would say for the political solution. So it's your governments, wherever you're from, working with the government of Somalia. And many governments have been doing that. There have been conferences in London. There have been conferences, I believe, in Brussels with the EU. Uh, there's one planned in Kenya. And it's these kinds of initiatives that would really uh, make a difference ultimately and bring an end to this uh, two-decade-old uh, displacement. OK. And James, you would add something or also uh, answer this question more or less your ideas about what is the, what would be the duties for the humanitarian workers uh, when the situations change and the people are sending to back to Somalia I think what we have wanted to see we have humanitarian organizations that work in the DAB camps and they have presence inside Somalia so some of the initiatives that we would want to see happening is that cross-border coordination between the agencies working in the DAB camps and um, the humanitarian agencies that are working in South and Central Somalia. Um, and I want to go back again to the situation that we had in our northern neighbor, the South Sudan. They were facing the same challenges that uh, Somalia is facing today. And for them, they, they were ready to confront their history and they were ready to invest time and resources to rebuilding their country, South Sudan. They are not where they would like to be, but we have seen a lot of progress in South Sudan. The conditions that existed in South Sudan before the, 19, the 2007 a comprehensive peace agreement were not any different from the conditions that exist inside Somalia. And like I said, um, the determination of the people of, uh, of Somalia who are living in the camps today, what they need is to be supported and to confront their past and be ready to go back and, and rebuild their countries. We have seen significant progress in South Sudan. We can see the same 
in Somalia in the next five years if the international community can be ready to um, develop Somalia, invest in Somalia, and support the people of Somalia from the camp life back to uh, their country. Okay. And I think there is a gentleman behind you from Somalia. It would be good to yes. have his... Our, our last question, uh, could he ask? Yeah, my name is Abdul Aziz from Somalia, from Mogadishu. The problem that we have in Somalia is not only the DAP. There is also been a refugee in Somalia, in Mogadishu and Puntaland and Somalia and Central Somalia. Those refugees who are now in the DAP, they are, as he told, they are from South Central Somalia. And this group, they want to go back to Somalia. The problem is the United Nations, they have no any office in Somalia. There is no any main office in UNHCR, UNDB, UNHCR, CARE. There is only agencies sitting there in Somalia. If the United Nations go back to Somalia, to Mogadishu, and start supporting Somalis, Mogadishu is free, and we have a big party in Mogadishu to support, and all support is coming from Mogadishu, the people come back alone to Somalia. Example, they started the last, last uh, two years, 200,000 Somalis left from Kenya, from Dadaab to Somalia. And last year, after the Kenyans attacked Kismayo and captured it, they left another 3,000 back to Dadaab. So if the world wants to help Somalia, they must go to Mogadishu and support Somalis in Somalia. Somalia is another country. Somalia is not Kenya. They are sitting all hotels in Kenya, the United Nations, and they just send some Somalis down to Somalia and say support some foodies to Somalia. If, if the people want to help Somalia, Mogadishu is free. The Somali government asked several times the uh, world community to come to Mogadishu and to support the Somalis and to sit and open offices in Mogadishu. Today Mogadishu is free, Baidawa is free, Kismaya is free. The Shababis, they are no more. Uh, they are not as strong as they were before. So the only solution is to, the, to help the Somalis in their country, not Kenya. And the Somalis, every Somali wants back to Somalia, although he is 20 or 30 years in, outside of Somalia. Uh, this is my experience, and this is what I want to tell. OK. Thank you. I think that there are two aspects. One, of course, you're right, it's your country. Um, maybe we, we should find a new way, I don't know, to support much more you in Somalia. But on the other hand, of course, there are a lot of people there, they're in Dadaab. You cannot say there are not, no people, and we cannot say uh, we have to send them back. Um, as you said, only when the people are really want, would like to go back. So I think there's two kind of situations. Um, yes, now I think um, uh, we should come more or less um, to, to the last 10 minutes of our panel. And um, yes, I would, I would like to ask you, I think it's, everybody's aware of this very, very difficult and, and, and tense situation. Could you maybe uh, give us uh, only small or uh, a short uh, information of what do you think about uh, what went wrong um, uh, in the last 20 years? And do you have maybe good, good um, and uh, successful stories what you have heard about uh, uh, the camp? What's, I think nothing, it's, uh, only, everything is not only bad. I think sometimes you have heard something that really could develop, establish good, that the people would uh, have an, um, an aspect of being um, more motivated um, to think of in future. So maybe you, you can talk about a bit these two aspects. Oh, bo both of you, you can start. Who would like to start? I think we are already 10 minutes past our time, actually. So I'm not sure. No, we start later, so oh, we okay. are thinking uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes later, so. <laughs> Um, a positive story from Dada. Yes, I think uh, it's good to start with this. <laughs> I'll make it short. Um, 
There's many, there are plenty. Uh, fortunately, I was um, uh, fortunate to be able to assist um, at a soccer training or football, as you may call it, football training for um, young people, women and uh, men uh, who are hearing impaired. And I don't think that when you think about a refugee camp, the first thing that comes to your mind is soccer practice and people with hearing disabilities and how that comes together. And it was one of the projects that many NGOs and, and, and UNHCR try to do to, to develop the, the sense of community and to give people uh, something, something to do and something to learn. So they flew in uh, a FIFA-trained um, uh, judge, referee, from, uh, from Nairobi, who actually taught um, the youth how to interact on a soccer field, because being hearing impaired, you can guess that like shouting and talking to each other, communicating uh, while you play football is a bit difficult, and they found very neat and, and interesting uh, ways of, of, of being a team and of scoring, and also having men and women in the same team, if you know a little bit about the Somali uh, community and how, how well, separated in many cases men and women are still, I found that really encouraging to see. And when, when I talked to the, um, uh, the people afterwards, they said what we really want to do is we want to tour Kenya and we want to play against other Kenyan uh, football teams and, uh, and practice our skills. So, of course, they're not going to be able to do that because they are stuck in Dada, but I felt like it's, it is something that maybe gives them a little bit of hope and also some, some skills to take back home to Somalia. James, do you could uh, contribute something? Uh, just two points on went, what went wrong uh, for the last 23 years. I think uh, the conflict in Somalia was ha somehow lost in the ladder. And um, it is like a forgotten crisis until 2010, 2011, when we started seeing now the international community coming up to support initiatives um, um, to stabilize Somalia, but before that, there was less, less and less engagement on initiatives that could have been taken 10 years ago to um, make Somalia a stable country. And I think uh, from 2010, 2011, the attention came back because of how then um, the operatives inside Somalia got uh, networked with other international terror organizations, and I think that refocused the attention to Somalia. But I think had such initiatives been taken five, ten years ago, then uh, the situation would have been a bit different. The second thing, um, I think the problem, the issue of encampment, a population of 300, 400,000, I do not think would have made a big difference in terms of how uh, Kenya as a country operates. Probably the thing that could have been done, these people would have been assimilated into the country. They give, be given um, land and support to, um, to have initiatives to look for their own food, uh, you can imagine the cost of delivering food for 23 years for 400,000. Um, much of this food comes as donations in kind. So the cost of that food by the time it reaches the dab is enormous. So if we had focused on how then these people would be supported, they'd be part of the Kenyan community, and they'd be given land and initiatives to, to do irrigation, and they produce their own land, I, don't, I think it would have made such a huge difference into their lives and it would have had a literal impact on the Kenyan economy. And in 2010, the Norwegian Refugee Council did a study inside the camps and amazing, uh, the volume of business that happens inside the Dadaab camp was in the scale of more than 40 million US dollars in a year. So that would have been a huge contribution to the Kenyan economy, and these people would be paying taxes today they don't. Okay, thank you.
So we have talked about the never-ending emergency of DADAP. Of course, we have not found a solution, but I think one point that really comes, comes out really clearly that people would like to go back, that you support them, and maybe that we should really help find a develop, make a developing plan for set up more infrastructure in Somalia. I don't know who, who should do that, but it's, it's, it's good to think about. Yes, because um, otherwise the, the camps will be uh, running the next 10, 20, uh, 20 years. But as you said, when you said, uh, talked about Sudan, you see really um, um, possibilities that maybe the, change, uh, the things could change in Somalia, that um, yes, that we have a, a bit few and hope. So it was my result from what you are talking. <laughs> I think the... I think the optimism that we have of seeing uh, a rebuilt Somalia uh, is the highest now. And we've not had an opportunity in the past that we have today to have uh, Somalia back on its feet. So I think it's a unique opportunity. And um, if our brothers and sisters from Somalia can borrow from South Sudan, uh, confront that situation, face the unknown, but there will always be a starting point. So it's everybody have the chance for last comments from our speakers, if you like. Some last comments. Okay. Thank you all for uh, hanging around until now <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. Either the town is dead or we were extremely um, you know, <laughs> engaging. But I hope you got... Uh, we got something out of it. One thing I would like to say, and this is the final thing I'll say, is um, I think it's important that uh, we also show some modesty in how we go about addressing the Somali question. It's been 20 years, and uh, we have done, I believe, everything that we felt was the right thing to do. We've uh, deployed every possible tool or strategy that we had in our so-called toolbox. And uh, things have not improved inside Somalia. But for a change, we now have a government in place. And we need to at least give this another try by supporting a Somali-led solution to Somalia's problems. The international community, as you could not say, has had uh, a rousing success so far. Uh, finally, we have a government in place. We have an international community that is engaged, that is really trying to support them to make sure that this time things work. And it's for us to support the, basically, pacification of Somalia, the stabilization of Somalia. But I would also like you to please remember the displaced people those who are inside Somalia, but also the refugees in Dadaab. As I said earlier, it would make such a huge difference if we could have enough resources to educate every child who deserves to go to school, all the way from primary to university. It would make a huge difference in terms of bringing peace to that country, in terms of making the country peaceful, and having it last and no longer be a problem for its people, but also for its neighbors and the rest of us. So please do what you can to help this process not falter. Thank you. James? You are fine? James, you oh, OK. Uh, I think I want, just want to appreciate the time that you have sat there and engaged us in a lively manner. Thank you very much for uh, that participation. Yes, <laughs> from my side as well. Thank you very much for your intention. It was really great that you were here. Thank you.